I'm here with Scott, and Scott, you work on wine for Ubuntu, is that right? Yes, I'm an Ubuntu packager. I've been making the wine packages for Ubuntu since Hori, which is forever now, about five years. And um, if it's wine and it's in Ubuntu, I've been responsible for it. Um, for, before me, wine sort of just didn't really happen in Ubuntu, and now it's on me. I work very much with upstream wine. Two months ago, I was at the uh, Wine Developer Summit, and the I was there talking about user interface improvements. Um, the wine right now uh, has two major areas it needs. It needs to work with applications, mm -hmm. which is what wine developers are always working on, just fixing bugs and replicating the Windows API and making iTunes work and all this sort of stuff. But wine also has um, a very sort of real disconnect for the user. It, it's, it feels separate. It feels like when you run wine, like, ugh, and I have this windows sort of creeping onto my system. And it's always been my view that wine should be invisible. You shouldn't even know you're running wine. And so for that matter, to make that happen, the best thing we can do is make the entire process of using Windows applications on Ubuntu just seamless to the user. But in order for that to happen, Wine itself need to have certain ways of configuring it automatically and doing things without having to do these special Wine tweaks. And so that was what I was at the Wine Developer Summit doing, essentially making feature requests and um, asking how these features will come about in the future. Okay. Um, so now that Wine developers have more or less agreed to do the back end, for instance, to make um, applications configurable through the command line, now someone needs to write the front end, which is mm -hmm. one of them, so I was basically volunteered for the job. <laughs> so, okay, I will um, work on writing, for instance, um, a GNOME GTK application, such that when I can right-click a Windows file and go to Properties, I can select which Windows version to use. Um, and so now uh, that's my goal for the immediate future for Jaunty, is to just get as much of this usability as I can into the wine we ship. Um, will that help people install the applications in the first place as well as running them? Um, yeah, so there, right now there's a really big hurdle in that um, if you don't even have wine installed and you put in your Windows game CD or something like that and you get um, the Windows application, uh, you really don't know what to do. If you try and just double click it without wine installed, it'll open up an archive manager and tell you it can't understand it. Um, what part of this project entails is making it such that when we open that, we present um, what Wine is to the user and present it as an option that they can download. Um, the analogy I like to make is how desktop effects were handled in Feisty. We said right. You can turn these on, they, um, they will maybe be useful to you, but it's sort of a technology demo. We're not, there's some bugs in it, we're not sure it will work, and then you click OK, Wine gets installed, and then when you double click the application, Wine will run it automatically, the installer will come up and you click through your install shield and it'll put it in this virtual C drive that's sort of hidden in your home directory. Um, when ideally that should be in places virtual C drive, um, the application will make some install shortcuts and instead of a Windows start menu, we'll put them at applications, Wine programs, uh, and then that's how you'll launch applications from there. Provided there's no bugs in Wine preventing the installer program from running, or for the program itself for that matter. And to do that, we need to use a later version of Wine, a good version of Wine. And so part of my work is to pick the upstream Wine version around the time Jaunty releases, and make sure there's no regressions relative to the current mm. Wine version. So if uh, someone in Intrepid has been happily using Wine and using some program, we really don't want to break that program when they go to Jaunty. And because Wine is not making a stable release in Jaunty's time frame, we have no guarantee of this unless we do a lot of sort of vigorous testing and pick a particular Wine version and, and cherry pick patches. Um, the other option is to do none of that and just keep using the same Wine version, but then we miss out on a whole lot of um, new features. For instance, a whole bunch of new applications have worked since Intrepid came out uh, if you use a Wine beta release. Okay, so you talked about having a, there not being a predicted stable release of Wine before Jaunty yeah. releases. Mm -hmm. Now, Wine hit 1.0 about a year ago. Yeah, a um, little after Hardy came out, so right. we actually backported it to Hardy. Okay. <laughs> 
So when is the next stable release likely to be, and, and what's going to be new in that release? Um, so one of the things that I was a big proponent of when I went to the Wine Developer Summit is um, having wine base itself around a time-based release schedule, ideally one that is compatible with Ubuntu, either six months or yearly and so on. Um, I was unsuccessful, but the instead wine is going to release on sort of a features-based release. And so the summary of WineConf was that once Wine makes one of its five new features somewhat stable, then they would start the release process. And so if you want to push out a new Wine release, you can help code one of these features and get it in. Um, one of the, f the five major features were a replacement for something called the Dib Engine, which is what Wine uses to render 2D graphics, which is um, the fact that Wine doesn't have one is why StarCraft is still slow, even though it's 2008. <laughs> um, the Direct 3D 10, um, if you start implementing that, then that's a huge feature and it will prompt a new release. Um, support for 64-bit Windows applications. Um, right now we have the luxury of sort of ignoring it because there are very few of them to actually worry about. Um, the USB support. So Wine could support arbitrary USB drivers, mm -hmm. like um, most notably iPods and iPod Touches, and you plug a new iPod in, and it will now actually work with iTunes. Mm -hmm. um, and one other one that isn't, that I can't remember, so. <laughs> well, the USB thing would have a huge impact. I know that I've tried to use the TomTom -Tom Home application yeah. under Wine, and it installs perfectly, and it even runs, you just can't talk to the TomTom. Yeah. Um, that so, other oh, that other feature was um, support for a Cocoa driver for Mac OS X. That we really don't care about. So. <laughs> okay. Cool. So, how big a development community is there around Wine? Um, so, Wine is interesting. It's a it's a fairly sizable upstream project. As far as number of developers that were at WineConf, um, there were I'd say about forty of us filling a large conference room. Um, but the number of people who contribute to Wine is sort of much larger than that. Mm -hmm. If you look through the author's file, there's something like two, three hundred people that have various levels of changes in there. Um, the Wine is a very old project. It's over 15 years old, so some of those developers have come and gone. Um, but if you look at um, statistics, it seems like Wine is one of the most popular projects there is. The... Uh, Ubuntu popularity contest says about 10% of our users are have a Wine at least installed, and somewhere around 6% of them have used it in the past week to run some application. So this means we get a lot of feedback in other ways, bug reports, um, forum pages. You can Google for many, many, many Wine how-tos, a lot of them obsolete, um, but there's a lot of people helping in different fashions. And so. Uh, that helps. There's also a large application database on Wine HQ where people test their new applications and see if they work with the latest Wine, and that in and of itself is a good form of contribution. Okay, cool. So what are the main things you're going to take away from this UDS? Main things from UDS? Well, I've, I'm not just a Wine guy. Um, I've been involved in other sorts of projects here. I'm really excited, for instance, about the new notification system that was talked about mm -hmm. because um, it's... It's something I thought of sort of independently for a while, and I was about to post about it, and it came up at UDS. Uh, the main reason I would want it is just because all sorts of applications, Wine included, can make these sort of passive notifications. For instance, when an application creates a start menu entry, um, it's not entirely obvious to the user that that would be a place to look in applications mm. program or Wine programs, whatever, right? So sort of a passive notification, hey, I just made a new programs menu entry that um, would help there. It's sort of like when you go to applications and remove and install uh, Frozen Bubble, it'll tell you Frozen Bubble is now in your games menu. Right? So the equivalent of that for why excellent use case of this notification system. Mm. Excellent. Okay, well I think we're just about out of time, but uh, thanks for talking to me today. Hey, anytime. Um, I'm going to make a Wine YouTube video showing the current status of Wine and Intrepid and um, upload it and hopefully link it to this video. So, we'll see you. Excellent. Thank you very much.